what I have to say. The Lord's table this evening will go very well with the message <clears throat> Brother Given gave this evening. <clears throat> and actually, I want to use the same text uh, that we discussed in our Bible class this morning in Hebrews 9. <clears throat> We're going to talk about the, the other half of that sentence. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, this evening we're going to talk about the rest of that. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 9, uh, <clears throat> Paul is opening up the importance of the blood of Christ. <clears throat> He's speaking of Christ bringing his blood into the holy place to e obtain eternal redemption for us. He also makes a strong point that the blood was required in the tabernacle service to sanctify everything. <clears throat> the book of the law was sprinkled with blood. The people were sprinkled with blood. The tabernacle was sprinkled with blood. All the vessels used in the tabernacle were sprinkled with blood. The covenant between God and the people was dedicated with blood. <clears throat> Now, it's not that God is a cruel and bloodthirsty God. That's not the situation at all. But the blood is the proof that a sacrifice for sin has been made. <clears throat> An innocent life was given in order to buy God's pardon of the guilty. Atonement, therefore, must be associated with death. That's the way God designed salvation. However, one of the deficiencies of the old sacrificial system was that the blood of those animals did not take away one single sin. Yeah. And now it did certainly serve God's purpose, but that purpose was not to atone for sins. No one was forgiven under the old covenant. That's because the blood of those animals was not effective with God. It was the blood of innocent animals, but not the blood of an innocent man. And man's blood should be shed because man had sinned against God. Another deficiency was that the blood of those animals was sprinkled in the tabernacle, but not in heaven itself, and God is in heaven. Furthermore, the inadequacy of the system was seen in the fact that it had to be done every year, over and over again. When the high priest died, another high priest had to take his place and keep up the bloody work. It had to be done over and over again because it wasn't really effective in the first place. Yeah. But when Jesus sacrificed himself, all of these deficiencies were resolved. Amen. He isn't an animal. He's the Lamb of God. Right. He is without sin, and he fulfilled the law of Moses. His blood is the real thing, and it is effective to this very day in paying for the sins of the whole world. Jesus' blood was not sprinkled in the tabernacle, or in the temple, but he took his own blood and presented it to the Father himself in the very place where the Father dwells in the sanctuary and the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. That is the throne of the majesty in the heavens, into heaven itself in the presence of God for us. Then in the last four verses of Hebrews 9, Paul deals with this last deficiency of the Levitical priesthood having to offer the sacrifice repeatedly. <clears throat> Nor yet that he, that is Jesus, should suffer, should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then he must, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. In other words, if Jesus' blood was not effective in paying for all sins, then he would have had to suffer for sins frequently, as, as in the old animal sacrifice system. Beginning at the foundation of the world, he would have had to die for Adam's sins, and then for Seth's generation, and then for Enoch's generation, and then die again for Kynan's generation, and so on and so on for every generation, including the present one, and if there are, there are any more to come after us, including those. Why didn't Jesus come and sacrifice himself for sins right after Adam and Eve sinned? Or right after Cain killed Abel? <clears throat> it was not necessary. His blood paid for all sins for all time. The point here is that Jesus had to suffer only once 
because his blood is effective. <clears throat> but now, once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. God is faithful and just and righteous, so if only one death is required, then only one death will be accomplished. God is not cruel and bloodthirsty. When payment has been made, no more suffering for sin will be required. God's righteousness in this is affirmed in the next verse, Hebrews 9, 27. And it is appointed unto men, want, and as it is appointed unto men, once to die, but after this the judgment. Why have men, men been appointed to die? It's because of sin. Mortality has been imposed upon our race because we were born in sin. David confessed, he said, I was conceived in sin. <clears throat> The nature that we inherited from Adam is a sinful and a corrupted nature. And part of the curse for Adam's sin is mortality. But this sentence is only required once for every man. Aren't you glad you only have to die once? Amen. The requirement of God is to die once, but after this the judgment. Because God is merciful, you only have to die once, then you receive the assessment of his assessment of your life, and this is never repeated. These are one-time appointments. Now, Paul is going to establish here and may use this as an example to make a point about Christ's death. It is right that we only have to die once. God's sentence upon humanity was righteous. Man should not live forever in a state of alienation and enmity to God. He should die once, but after this the judgment. So, in like manner... Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now this is right too. <clears throat> Christ only needed to be offered one time to be the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. It would be unrighteous of God to demand any more suffering from Jesus. And God has no such a demand. Jesus Christ has made God the blessed God. God saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied. And in a way, Jesus was judged of God after his death on the cross. God's assessment of his work was, Therefore will I divide him with a, a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And here's another assessment, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies." And again, unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, even thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. <clears throat> now the last time the world saw Jesus, he was hanging on a cross, laden with our sins and forsaken of God. Now his disciples saw him after his resurrection, but the world did not. That's the last time the world saw Jesus. But the next time he appears in the world, it will not be that way. He will not appear with sin on him, nor to deal with sin, but he will appear for us without sin unto salvation. Amen. Amen.